Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. And I also want to introduce my um, co-moderator and amazing brother friend, uh, Mama Ganoush. Hi, everyone. Marhaba. Uh, and it's me, Mama Ganoush. Uh, my name is Mama Ganoush. I'm a trans and disabled uh, Palestinian drag artist and the founder of the Heritage Activist and Liberation Artist Collective, short for HALA. Uh, I'm also a third generation activist and a child of two Palestinians, uh, one from Yaf and the other is from Gaza. I am so grateful to join a global 24 hour solidarity for Palestine today. As Lida mentioned, I have a very good friend, uh, my sister Nida Bintlifta. Uh, Nida is an activist, she's an artist, an educator, she's originally Lifta Wiyye from Lifta, uh, Palestine, and now living on Ohlone land on, of Oakland, uh, California. Nida is the daughter of one of the last generations of reborn Palestinians and has been fighting for the liberation for her homeland since she was a toddler on her father's shoulder at protests. Uh, Nida and I today will talk about the Israel, how Israel utilizes radical issues and causes such as feminism and LGBTQ rights to distract or justify the 76 years of ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. And to start us off, um, Nida, I'm curious if you maybe can educate us on the history of Palestinian feminism and how the movement continues to live on. Um, hello, Ranoush. It's so good to see you and be in community with you always. Um, I also want to say how incredible this event is and how proud I am to be a part of this global 24 hours solidarity for Palestine all around the world, um, including back home, Philip Lad. Um, so I'm so proud to be here with you, my uh, dear brother. Thanks for that question. Um, it's really frustrating how this occupation uh, has and can restructure the way our culture shows up in these spaces. Um, I've never known my people uh, to be hateful. And so when I hear these tropes and propaganda come out, it's confusing for me and others, obviously, because sometimes we even fall for the hype. Um, I have a memory about uh, sexuality from from Palestine that I, I'd want to share with you. I don't think I've ever shared this with you. Uh, I was walking around Ramallah with my mom, um, I don't know, a teenage years, and I saw two men holding hands uh, with their pinkies. And I said, oh my God, <laughs> mama, I thought, I thought being gay is haram, you know, not allowed. And she quickly said, that's not gay. We live, we love different here. And that just shaped uh, my views on what love was, how it showed up, and how it really belongs to everyone. So the idea that feminism is not closely interconnected in the LGBT community is propaganda that the Israeli occupation and the U.S. has been trying to push for generations. In reality, Palestinian women, girls, and gender diverse gender conforming people face multiple sources of violence. This violence is not only perpetrated by the patriarchal systems that we live in and exist around the world. They're not unique just to Palestinians or Arab or whatever these myths are, um, but it's even more inhumane for Palestinians living under this occupation because of the violence the Israeli military has um, towards these marginalized populations, feminists, gender conforming people, as, and the LGBTQ community. Um, Nina, thank you for this. And Allah Khalili Kin Mama, Ya Rab. Just reflecting on this, uh, one of my aunts calls my, uh, my, uh, my fake eyelashes that I wear for drag uh, Lulu after my sister. So. I said homage to my sister Lulu. Um, so uh, on that note, actually, uh, how do you think Israel utilizes that as a weapon of genocide? What I mean by that is, um, and we're going to talk in, in depth about uh, LGBTQ rights and how it's abused. Um, but I'm just curious, like prepping us to this, um, from, a, from, a, from a feminist perspective, from a queer and an ally perspective, how do you think this is 
uh, been weaponized by genocide, being a Palestinian woman? Like, how do you see it? Yeah, um, you know, this is a great question, uh, Vanush. Thank you. Because we know for a fact Israel does utilize feminism as a weapon of genocide and torture and occupation. Um, they are well aware of first and foremost that the womb of the Palestinian woman is also a tool of resistance amid this occupation for generations. It has been a tool of resistance. And for far too long, Israel has seen the Palestinian reproductive system and role um, as a threat. So um, the systemic violence that has disrupted our cultural and our social and our biological reproduction of our, you know, our people, our Palestinian people, is what Israel's tactics are and how they use this as um, a weapon of genocide. Many women today in Gaza have no other option, right? They're having babies. They're having babies with no anesthesia. Sometimes the doctors are um, are using fl- uh, their cell phones for flashlights just to have uh, the operations. And we we all know it. We know it. You know it. I know it. Everyone watching, we're all bearing witness to this. They're they've desecrated hospitals, um, which are big the biggest uh, targets. So these conditions have raised all the miscarriages and the um, and the premature births of women, um, and so this is a huge tactic that Israel has used in the past, uh, continues to use now. Um, you know, even going forward because of this, even if there's a ceasefire today, there are newborns still dying. Um, the blockade has left women with insufficient supplies to feed their children, to even have enough food to breastfeed. Um, So we all know that this is what Israel has been doing for generations and most recently now in this most current genocide. But we will learn more about this. Um, I want you to know, and I'm looking forward to it, we're going to learn more about the Palestinian feminist movement um, later in session 13. Um, It's titled Feminism and Palestine, uh, How Our Liberation is Mutual, Collective, and Intertwined. This discussion is always uh, very similar, Ranoush, because all of our struggles, all of it, every single struggle in the world is connected, right? People around the world, animal rights, disability, LGBTQ, they've all joined the struggle to liberate Palestine. Yeah, and that's a really good perspective because when you talked about how uh, Palestinian women uh, struggle to give birth, and I thought about Jesus for a minute. A lot of people say, like, you know, what if Jesus was queer or Jesus like loved the queers? Well, he came from a woman, or he came from from his mother who had to give birth a Palestinian woman also without anesthesia. Um, so uh, for me, like, it's it's what I mean by that is like usually colonization tried to put us into different identities and then use these identities to utilize for genocide where when they look at queer folks they talk about queer rights without forgetting about where those queer people fit within their community uh and how these other issues like affect them first first on with the with the feminist issue um and we're going to talk more about this in our in our pink washing section but on that note actually i'm curious and i know we have a lot to talk about afterwards but just kind of a it's a reminder for people how uh, colonization tools are very similar. But if you want to preface and just talk a little bit, uh, Nida, about um, the reality of Palestinian women hella under occupation and displacement, like, and 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 how does that I- affect you? Um, you know, the reality of Palestinian Palestinian period, and you know, Palestinian women. Um, and gender non-conforming people under occupation is is horrible. And um by 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 design, it's created 
different levels as well. The, you know, the experience for women um, in the West Bank is extremely different than experience for women in, let's say, Jerusalem or even in Gaza, which we know currently is, you know, destitute in, in Gaza, right? Um so uh, the reality of Palestinian women under occupation in general and displacement um, has so many challenges, Vanoush. Uh, daily lives um, it's, is impacted. Everything. The opportunities they have, um, the marriages they could have even, uh, their IDs, what color. <laughs> Um, there's just so many political challenges. There's so many cultural challenges. Healthcare, we spoke about that a little while ago. Educational challenges. Um, Israel stops visas from happening, not allowing women to, to continue, but not only women, everyone in Palestine. Um, and that's, that's, you know, despite all these challenges, Palestinian women and other folks have shown remarkable resilience and activism. Um, and they've been the forefront of the grassroots movement uh, here in the Bay, around the world, um, fighting and advocating for peace, justice, and gender equality um, here and in Palestine. So the reality is, uh, Ranoush, that the experience highlight the need for, for us to continue supporting Palestinian folks, uh, whether, you know, Palestinian women and uh, LGBTQ folks um, in Palestine and here, uh, so we can um, continue strengthening our solidarity and efforts towards achieving um, peace in the region and a free and liberated Palestine. And, and on that note, actually, that, that's a really good segue, because um, when people think about LGBTQ plus rights, especially in an extremely neoliberal cities like uh, Ramatash Uloni, known as San Francisco, California now, um, it is interesting that they look at it as a gay man. Like, <laughs> they dismiss that there is queer women, they dismiss that there is queer femme folks, they dismiss trans folks. And the reason why it's just extremely connected because most of the people that are Zionists that are in power in a city like San Francisco are actually gay men. So it makes sense that they are customizing things to their own needs. Um, but um, I, uh, I just to kind of a, to, to, deep, to dive deeper into like the nerd out section and the history part. Um, I imagine that like the Zionist project, similar tactics are not new. It's just the queerness and feminism are the are the are the the terms of what we're living in right now in liberal communities. But if you wanna go ahead. Habibi. Oh, I'm sorry. I was gonna say that you you know Ranusha, and you know that, and I imagine you. I'm pretty sure, and I hope you get into it. Is that the Zionist Project uses similar tactics um, with the LGBT community? Um, using the LGBT community as a weapon of genocide. So how about how about that? Can you tell us how how um, how they use the LGBTQ community and rights as a weapon of genocide around pink washing and and uh, yeah, and, definitely yeah. And I'm, yeah. and I'm sorry if it was a little bit repetitive to some folks on the call, but if you want to explain pink washing, you have to know few terms. There's few terms you have to know really well. The first one is one, what is pink washing? So pink washing, it uses LGBTQ plus rights to improve Israel's image uh, while masking the occupation and treatment of Palestinians uh, viewed as a form of colonial violence uh, that alienates queer Palestinians in general. But also it's an expansion to a marketing campaign that Israel had that I know uh, starting with like you know the the powerful I I F like feminist woman soldier uh, versus and also the the new Jew versus the old Jew the old Jew is sickly the new Jew is powerful the old Jew is Eastern the new Jew is Western so this is like has been um, an extension of brand Israel campaign and that's the second thing you need to know the second thing is what is brand Israel. The brand Israel is aims to reshape Israel's global image through positive portrayals of its culture and advancements as it criticizes the propaganda effort to distract from the human rights abuse. And it is basically a marketing campaign uh, that was afterwards uh, supported by a company called, uh, or an organization called A Wider Bridge. So Wider Bridge is the third term you need to know when you talk about pink washing. So Wider Bridge, it's 
Um, it's a it's a marketing basically advocacy campaign for Israel that adopted the idea of showing Israel as a as a as a queer destination, um, targeting San Francisco specifically. Actually, that was the main focus of the campaign. I think it started in two thousand and five. Uh, because it is the center of tech, there is a lot of money in tech and power. And then the second one is because it is gay mecca, and that's progressively. If you're associated with San Francisco, you're associated with progressive norms. So a wider bridge, um, it is literally like a right wing organization manipulating LGBTQ rights uh, for uh, masking Israel. And the last thing is called Hasbara. So all of that was part of Hasbara. And Hasbara is a public diplomacy effort to defend Israel's policies. And it's often seen as uh, mainly what their tactics are mis uh, disinformation and marginalizing Palestinian narratives. And that's an expansion of a bigger marketing campaign. So what I'm saying here is that pinkwashing is part of brand Israel that has been communicated by a wider bridge that is basically part of Hasbara overall um, way of uh, normalizing the genocide and 76 years of ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, especially that uh, the the right wing government and this is the liberal Zionist gays uh, specifically because um, a lot of them are gay men. But there's some queer folks also, unfortunately. But um, but what I mean by that is um, the they talk about Israel in the perspective of Netanyahu and a conservative government, and that's why things are bad. We're dismissing that before these the past 19 years, is 15 years of Israeli politics where things get in power. It has been a liberal government uh, that and a centrist and a liberal government that has been abusing uh, Palestinians for 76 years, including queer folks. And we're going to talk about this for a moment. Um, so in 2005, as I mentioned, the brand Israel launched. And um, the Israel initiated the brand Israel as a goal of transforming international Israel. As we said, that we talked about this. But one of the key things that we, we want to give you an example is what they did. So, so in 2009, there was um, uh, the Tel Aviv Gay Center shooting that happened in Israel. And the Israeli Ministry of Tourism launched the Tel Aviv Gay Vibe campaign. And this effort was marketed Tel Aviv as an international gay destination, uh, showcasing the beaches, the nightlife, the inclusive atmosphere, all the cute stuff. And the campaign included substantial investment in marketing, targeting European and North American uh, tourists, especially LG LGBTQ+. Um, and, and just to take a pause specifically on this information, is that uh, as we are speaking right now, gay marriage is not legal in Israel. So these like liberal, not progressive, I would say liberal things are not even available for Israelis even in a time where Israel had a more liberal government. The second one is marriage in Israel is required to happen on a rabbi. This is basically like a, a religious a religious marriage. So civil marriage has a lot of difficulties to happen in Israel. So you can think about domestic partnership and how queer folks live together that are actually colonizers, like settler colonizers, Israelis, are the ones who are not even enjoying the gay rights that they are promoting that the country has. Uh, while trying to dismiss the genocide or make it cute. Um, uh, the other thing that I also want to mention is the history of the term itself. So pinkwashing um, was uh, popularized by the activist Sarah Schulman. She's uh, an anti-Zionist Jewish queer um, uh, 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 author and, and, uh, and, and, and activist and movement leader. And an organization called uh, Queer Undermining Israeli Terrorism, or QUIT, they are a local um, Bay Area um, uh, organization that does a lot of direct action. And they basically adopted this term, and it originally came from women and breast cancer and how using some of these campaigns to manipulate women. That's where the term itself, pinkwashing, came from. And, um, and that happened in 2010. However, brand Israel and branding Israel is something that was happening for a few years before that. And that just came to, um, to like, uh, sort of uh, quantify it for activists and people to understand and explain what it actually means. Um, and then Sarah Schulman in 2011, it was a pivotal moment when New York Times um, bringing the mainstream attention to the concept of, brain, of brainwashing through this article, where she argued that the emphasis on LGBTQ plus rights was a deliberate tactic to obscure its oppressive policies, as if like Americans, I mean, a lot of people do not understand that many Palestinians we do, but a lot of people don't. 
And, um, and at that time, Shulman had a lot of work highlighting the need of intersectional solidarity. A lot of Zionist people showed up to the gay center in New York, because I used to live there at that time. I remember around, around this time of this article to protest her presence. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. It has been ages around. So I know I've been, he talks a lot, but, um, I just want to say that, um, I'm going to keep you up with this four terms, think washing, uh, brand Israel, Hasbara, and, um, and the last term is, um, a wider bridge. And if you think about LGBTQ press abuse by Israel, all of this is part of a marketing campaign. This is a marketing campaign uh, for settler colonialism. And Nida, all yours. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Like any, any, did you, uh, some of these things are new to you. I know you've been, you've been in the streets with us a lot. So. <laughs> We're all in the streets. Um, I hope, um, you know, I'll be, I'm going to be very transparent with you. The only thing I knew, the only two terms I knew were pink washing and brand Israel. So I didn't even know the uh, most of these things um, and the amount of effort. That what I was like thinking was the amount of effort these occupies occupiers go through to to demonize our people and our joy is is just beyond um, imaginable. So, so I just want to I just want to reiterate like so there's um, a brand Israel, which is propaganda trying to. Uh, trying to shape Israelis and the image of Israelis by f- pushing false portrayals that look happy, like oh, be be gay in Israel, um, but you know they're really not. Um, the it's also, second- it's also beyond that too, because for example, Gal Gadud came up in this similar campaign for showing up like the strong Israeli woman, you know, like I'm going to kill all these Palestinians and I will look sexy. That was also and, part yeah, of like, the, 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 mo- the model, the model, um, military, uh, occupier, like, yeah. Um, yeah. And then another term was Hezbollah, which is the public diplomacy efforts, um, that defends, uh, these illegal and racist Israeli policies that spread uh, misinformation and silence Palestinian stories and narratives. Um, then, of course, pinkwashing is, which is uh, something I was familiar with, um, which is, you know, the practice of, and, you know, it, which baffles my mind when I meet gay uh, LGBTQ plus people and um, they're Israeli supporters. It's like, what is happening? So that's probably the um, conclusion of pinkwashing at work, where they uh, use LBGTQ rights to improve Israel's image while they occupy, violate, and continue to genocide Palestinians. Um, and finally, you talked about a wider bridge, which connects LGBTQ communities to garner support for Israel. Um, and they also partner with right-wing organizations right here in the U.S. It's, it's basically like a marketing tool. Like, it's right. just an advocacy group or a marketing tool. It's a really good marketing campaign because the, I mean, unfortunately, the genocide uh, made it very difficult for them at this point. But uh, but for a long time, they had, like, the, I would say, like, the, the false narrative has been empowered by a wider bridge. Which uh, one of the local people that are gay here, they're going to talk about them for a minute, is was part of this campaign. So, thank you for sharing all of that, Ranoush. Um, this information, it's important. We need to know this. People need to know this, and they need to understand that um, Israel has controlled the narrative about LGBTQ Palestinians and the false image that they are a safe haven. For, for LGBTQ, and that's the farthest from the truth. So thank you. But with all the campaigns you mentioned um, and how they begin to shape the propaganda that's being pushed to the world, um, uh, I say the world, I and let's be real, typically like the white and Western places, um, uh, tourists, like you said, the LGBTQ tourists. Why is this type of propaganda so important in shaping and strengthening um, the Zionist occupation project? It's really just an extension of settler colonialism. So, uh, for example, the Roman Empire um, and even like 
very soon, very, very recently, like European, European settlers that came to North America, to Turtle Island, uh, they came to save Americans from savagery by killing all the Native Americans and raping their women. Like, it's, it's a very similar thing. But um, so this is a pretty much like a tactic of Brandon's Raid and pinkwashing. It's just part of this broader strategy. Uh, where the colonizer seeks to dehumanize the colonized and then justify their control. So by presenting Israel itself as a progressive and a modern state, we're European, you know, we're part of the, what is it called? The Eurovision. You don't watch this. Um, Israel attempts to draw a start, a contrast between itself and the Palestinian society. So, which is, um, it portrays as a uh, Palestinians are backwards and intolerant where Israelis are progressive and cool. And the mirrors the historical colonial tactics that colonization just depicted themselves as bringing civilization to primitive societies. Um, and, and to answer your question why this is important for settler colonialism, this dehumanization tactic, is the first one is divide and conquer, right? So uh, pinkwashing works to divide Palestinian society by, you know, alienating the queers and reinforcing stereotypes that associate with them with Israeli collaborators um, and then the stack six aim to weaken the collective um, uh, Palestinian resistance by creating internal divisions like that. And also like Ishara is caught, which is basically um, causing that fear between you and your community. Um, the second one is cultural superiority, as we said. So by emphasizing that LGBTQ plus inclusivity, Israel positions itself as the beacon of progress in otherwise intolerant region of the Middle East. Where Lebanon is next door, you know, like the first porn I've seen was a Lebanese. I mean, we're not going to talk about this right now, but um, this narrative echoes the colonial justification of bringing civilization to the uncivilized or like sexual freedom and things like that, further dehumanizing Palestinians and justifying their oppressions. And that's one of the main reasons, for example, they don't even talk about the men they kill. They always talk about women, kids. And then now in San Francisco and other places, they talk about the queers. Um, and then the propaganda and distraction overall. So the use of LGBTQ press as a distraction from the human rights abuses is form of a propaganda. Um, you know, I grew up in uh, in Egypt in the basement, um, Barak in the old regime, when there used to be like a big thing that happened in Palestine that he used to want to cover it. He used to run a huge soccer match. That's the same concept for like totalitarianism and or Stalinist regimes where uh, this um, this happens at the same time, which is distracting you with this issue. Uh, and at the same time, we're basically taking all these lands in, in West Jerusalem um, and not talk about 1948 Palestine. Um, so to brand this up as a conclusion, just the, the interplay between uh, brand Israel, pink washing, a wider bridge, Hasbara, illustrates a comprehensive strategy to reshape Israel's global image while continuing its oppressive policies. So these efforts are deeply rooted in colonial practices. Uh, so always think about this. I want people leaving the session today to think Israel equals, you know, war criminal genociders, Palestinians equals heroes, really, uh, for freedom for everybody, including the queers. Um, and we could talk, uh, I mean, we, I think we'll discuss later how does that present itself. So, um, what do you think, Nido? Sorry if I was over, 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 over our appointed time for that. But. Oh my God, there's no appointed time. Um, I could listen to you speak about anything actually. Um, so, uh, this is very interesting and, you know, I've, I've learned a lot about, uh, colonialism and how that's all interconnected um, and how all these regions of the world, how they try to keep us so disconnected, but how we are really interconnected. Um, my question is, you speak about this, right, on a bigger scheme of how we're all, um, you know, how pinkwashing, Brand Israel, Wider Bridge, how it all interconnects and it's trying to like create this propaganda around the world. How does that work locally? You talked about worldwide, like locally and like local governments, let's say local events. How, what do you feel about that? Yeah, just to give the, the audience that might not live where I live. Um, I live in San Francisco, like which is the Ramatash Ohlone land. That's the indigenous name for it. And I live in a neighborhood that is super queer. It's like the Castro, it's not queer, sorry, the gay neighborhood. And everybody represented me in American government is a Zionist that takes money from Israel and have been coming up against the ceasefire. 
And my first person I had is Raphael Mendelman. He's the supervisor for my district. He's a gay man and is extremely conservative and he's Democrat on paper. And he's one of the few people that did not sign a ceasefire resolution and uh, humiliated me personally when I went to him with a bunch of people that came across different uh, religions and backgrounds. He, and then afterwards, Scott Wiener, who's also a gay man, extreme Zionist, extremely pro-Israel. He's actually part of the Jewish, California Jewish caucus. Uh, which is basically the caucus that, uh, it, you know, selects candidates that the APAC, which is the biggest Zion, like American Israeli lobby, uh, would sponsor. So he's part of this committee, basically, that does that. And he's part of like every single part of any conservative pro Israeli extremist Zionist organizations, uh, like JCRC and AGC. These are very popular names that we have here in our local activism. Uh, and then afterwards, Nancy Pelosi, the queen of them all. So that's like the one who's literally running the entire country to make sure that Israel is served and we're giving money out. And then my two senators, Adam Schiff and Alex Padilla, are also anti-Palestinian. They are they refuse to do any form for ceasefire, and all of them take money from APAC. And of course, our president, uh, the same, who's an unexpected Zionist. Just to give you an idea how much Zionism controls every single thing to the local position of somebody living in America. Um, however, the the movement on a very grassroots level, from my experience, and a lot of people, is really like on the shoulders of queer and trans people. Uh, queer and trans people have been front and center of this. Um, because, again, if you are a trans person, and I consider myself trans and I'm queer, you are apartheid in your body. You're, people put restrictions on what your gender is, how you want to express it, how do you think about it, everything else. So we understand the idea of what does it mean to be stuck in your own self and you, without any form of uh, recognition. Um, and also I'm Palestinian. I am brought by Palestinians that they give a shit. They kept me safe as a trans person until I aged. I mean, my four, she's in her 40s now. Um, and these are the people who kept me safe, our Palestinians. Uh, and continue to keep me safe, our Palestinians and my community and comrades locally here. So, and to give you an idea, how does that present itself? So we have key movements that are queer and trans that are actually coming out for Palestine, whether they are oh, like run or founded by queer and trans people or led by a lot of queer and trans people, including uh, Iraq, the Arab Resource Center, including Jewish Voice for Peace, including International Jewish uh, Anti-Zionist Network, including QUIT, which is the Queer Undermining Israeli Terrorism, Gay Shame, literally it's called Gay Shame, like to shame like gentrifiers and Zionists and others. But we also have anonymous and autonomous folks. A lot of people that actually shut down the embassy and the consulate are trans folks. Like the people that you see on the news in Al Jazeera, they did the whole bridge. Uh, some of them are also, some of them are also queer. Like a lot of them are queer, you know, and they're not only queer, but a lot of them are queer. So as queers, we are in the street. And then Gen Z, which is uh, the generation right now that is very aware of Palestine, most of them identify actually gender fluid, especially in the United States. So queerness, not most of them, a big percentage of them. Um, the second one is the encampments. So most of the campus encampments that you have seen, a lot of them that I know about were led by trans and queer folks. That includes like uh, UC Berkeley encampment and others. So queer and trans folks literally putting their bodies on the line for Palestine. Um, the mutual aids, we have a lot of mutual aid organizations like uh, uh, Bay Area to Gaza is led by and founded by a queer professor who's a faculty at UC Berkeley, is a very good friend of mine that I respect highly, Brooke and others. Um, so that's also, this is a queer uh, founded mutual aids. Um, independent journalism, a lot of the journalists that actually are covering Palestine are queer. <laughs> Like uh, Toshio, uh, like we don't have a lot of local journalism really in San Francisco at this point because a lot of mainstream media took over, uh, including a very conservative company called Sinclair. Um, but most of these journalists like Toshio, like uh, like um, Zenubia from local, Mission Local are queer folks. Um, the boycott campaigns on pride institutions are also led by queer folks, including myself, but a lot of others. And I'm not like the one who did it. It has been for years people are boycotting pride. And for people who doesn't know, in San Francisco, we, we led a boycott campaign for Pride, and we did a dying in front of a, a store that is owned by uh, a queer, a gay liberal Zionist who's very much pro-genocide. 
um, uh, sorry, pro, like he celebrated the neck bay and stuff like that uh, in the mission, uh, which is a highly gentrified area at this point. And the last but not least, we had the direct uh, disruptions on bigger scales. Like, for example, New York Fashion Week, I was, I guess she was walking on it. I was modeling for a friend of mine and we, we did organize a full takeover of stage and all of these distractions. There is a, there is a, there is groups called like models for Palestine. So Palestine is like uh, an issue that everyone supports, uh, including the modeling business. So, and then the last thing we have funds like the drag artists for Palestine and Oak Clash. They started a fund for artists who would like to skip um, um, a, a, like a, an event, for instance, but they need the pay because that event is racist or Zionist. It's called the Bad Fund and the Lad Fund. Um, and then the the last but not all is my collective. So we have a collective that is run mostly by queer and trans folks uh, to continue building at and collaborating for Palestine. Um, so how about how about you, Nida? Can you talk more about the broader artist community in San Francisco or like anywhere else? Um, Renush, I want to say, uh, I saw your fashion week show and was she (laughs) hitting the runway? Yes, she was. She was, and she was never (laughs) reported. They didn't report that the mainstream media didn't report the entire collection of this poor designer who had no idea what was going to happen. And, but you know what? We had a party and everybody in that in that fashion it was a getty images one and had a lot of like journalists nobody reported about any of this we disrupted three of the biggest runway shows that day and i mean at that time there was a lot of other disruptions happening but we were trying to do it yeah incredible incredible something um we were all here in the bay area watching and so proud of Um, And speaking of the Bay Area, you know, one of the things I've learned, and you spoke about this a little bit, is like the politicians in San Francisco, the biggest gay Mecca in the world, supposedly, right? And the most liberal place in the United States. And here we have gay representatives and supervisors and um, Congress people who are Zionist genocide supporters. Um, those things don't make sense together, right? And so um, I appreciate you and your collectives um, supporting the um, the you know outing of these institutions uh, and people uh, because they aren't who they say they are, right? Um, and speaking lastly of your collective, I I just took a note here. I've been to your Hella uh, salons. Um, several times and every single time standing room only standing room only so i love to see it i lo- i just love to see it and and yeah and, and, and to talk more about that nida so we have a collective called hella that we mentioned and this collective is basically an, an unapologetic anti-zionist um um uh, accessible collective that it really centers um, uh, anyone, all the artists and activists who are centering Palestine in their work right now. Um, And we have over 40, actually six artists, uh, all the way in Paris. We have people in Lebanon and Beirut, and we have most of the people are in Ohlone-like lands um, in in what we know now as San Francisco. Uh, And also we have like one token straight guy, uh, Jonathan Randall in New York, and another one token straight person. Their name is June, she's awesome. So what I mean by that, our collective, basically what it do is that we we make events where these artists could get paid because these days a lot of them are getting docs on a, on a, on a very like limited level. But also the goal from this is to build these events that provide a mutual connection between different activist groups. Um, so this is really, all the events are really focused on celebrating activists, building hope, but building community. Um, and we have the salon, as uh, Nida mentioned, it's an art salon, like Salon Sakafi, that we have on monthly basis at the Harvey Milk's camera shop. Uh, Harvey Milk is one of the very known names in gay history because he was the first uh, out gay person to run in politics in San Francisco, and he got shot. So, um, and, uh, and we have also Opera Palestina. We called it From the River to the Sea. 
uh, that we had um, a snapshot for it. And, and now we're building like a Baruch uh, slash African-American spirituality sort of entire project for this opera. And uh, we have a cabaret called Cabaret Palestina that celebrates all the different, mainly mainly indigenous folks, actually, and trans folks that were our comrades that, um, that have performed. And now we are also looking at have an open mic. So we have a lot of these different events that gather community together. So it's an I, open collective for all and you could, anyone could join it. You could check my website. Yeah. I was going to say, if you could say the website, um, maybe. Yeah. Just, yeah. It's just my name, mama Okay. Um, yeah. Mama Ganoosh.com with I, two I, years. I, yeah. Mama Ganoosh.com with two years. You know, you are so Palestinian with all the things that you're doing. <laughs> you're like, and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. And, and, you know, when I have 17 minutes, I'm doing this. I love to see it. Um, and I also want to say that I, I love to see when our queer and trans folks are showing up and they are showing up and showing out um, for this fight for Palestinian liberation. Um, I've actually been to a few um, protests where everyone, everything I look around is queer and trans and it's it's beautiful. So I'm, pr- I'm proud of folks like you who create these spaces for people to go and be in community with one another. I'm really grateful for that. I thank you for it. Um, and we know that throughout history, art has been a vital part important part of Palestinian resistance. And, and it's been used as an instrument to continue and, and to, um, to continue reaffirming our political existence in this world. Um, as, as silly and simple as a watermelon. You know, I lived in Palestine when the law was made that the Palestinian flag and its colors were illegal. I, I remember that. And so um, as Israel's genocide continues, Artists across the world continue using their art and work to show support and solidarity with us. And, um, you know, just like right now, what we're doing is a great example with the Global 24 Hours Solidarity for Palestine, um, with groups like uh, you mentioned a few earlier, and I'll mention uh, groups like Golden Thread Productions, um, Art to Forces, uh, Mina Theater Makers Alliance, um, and so many others, right? Uh, from graffiti to breakdancing to skateboarding, to the trees, to like the simplest of our cultural art forms. Palestinians have found a way to continue to connect and share experiences of our culture and identity so it's not erased, right? And you're a part of that. Yeah, I was going to tell you also drag. Hala, I'm a Palestinian drag. I'm a Palestinian drag queen. We don't have a lot of us. Um, <laughs> but you could see me dancing ala when ala Ramallah. We are Yumma, Fida Ga'abebna, and a lot of like uh, a, a language. And Julia Butros, I mean, her mother is Palestinian, but also um, um, she is Lebanese and she's an activist, she's a comrade. And also people when they think about Palestinians and queer folks, they think about it also in isolation from our region, like from Lebanon and what's going on in Lebanon right now, the attack on Lebanese institutions, the cultures, the attack on Lebanese ideology, um, the attack on Lebanese uh, civil rights and democracy, talking about the only democratic state in, in the Middle East, it's actually Lebanon, it's not Israel. So, um, <laughs> so, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are happening in terms of isolating from each other and also a lot of organizations that are Lebanese have started a lot of queer activism in the region like Kalim and, and other organizations that I I at some point also belonged to when I was in the region. So sorry, back to you. No, I, I love it. Thank you so much. Um, uh, there's also organizations, and I want to say this for people who are looking for ways to get involved. Um queer or otherwise these are all spaces you are welcome um and i'll i'll do it again there are organizations like golden thread production art to action mina theater makers alliance a star theater the freedom theater zukak theater company Noor theater donkey saddle projects dunya productions um, and thanks to uh, HowlRound Theater for comments for for producing this. So uh, for having this on their um, site. So I wanted to say I'm grateful for these spaces, right? Because I'm able, as well as so many other artists, including yourself and others, uh, are able to show up for the liberation of Palestine through art form. 
And um, one thing you, I know you asked me earlier about uh, if there's other art forms that I would know of other than like the queer and trans uh, spaces. And like currently we are, uh, there's a mural being painted in Oakland, California, which is where I'm uh, residing um, on Ohlone lands, uh, which is now Oakland, California. And the mural is called the Samud Mural Project. Samud means uh, steadfastness in Arabic. Um, it's the Samud Mural Project that's a transformative community mural, po mural project. Um, and it's meant, the meaning behind it is to break prison walls here and everywhere, um, as well as to uplift steadfastness in the liberation movement work, because it's really hard work. Um, there are artists in the Bay that are creating fundraisers, such as Mama uh, Ganoush just mentioned to us. So uh, donating uh, to these organizations, support queer and trans artists, continue working in such a racist and hateful environment, um, such as Hollywood or, or other spaces where they might look for work. Um, so join organizations and look at, look at Mama Anusha's website. I know it's, it's, I love your new um, update on the website, Ranoush. It's like resources and toolkits and who to call and what to do. And it's like anyone who doesn't know what the next step is, is go to Mama Ranoush's website. Can, uh, you, can you tell hey. us like what they should do to sign up and get information and stay involved? Uh, yeah, if you're a millennial into websites at this point, um, like me, <laughs> you could go to my website and it's a collection of a lot of things I collected from other resources like AROC provided a lot and GVP. Um, so they have this like basically like archives and things, uh, which is really awesome and Golden Fat Theater too. Um, so you could actually join the collective. So you could join mamaganoosh.com. You go to the, the Hala, there's a full like part of it. You could read more about our tenants and everything else. You could see other artists and you also could stay autonomous. Given that we're an activist collection, we have to have an autonomous, um, an autonomous version of this where you could be involved autonomously, uh, whether by participating as a member or uh, not being publicly shown. The other thing also you could do is because I'm on Instagram, I am live on, on, on Twitter. It's all under the same name, Mama Ganoush. And, oh, you could just text, like, text me. <laughs> this is an Arab thing. Uh, you could just send me an email. Uh, you could find also my contact on my website, too. So uh, one thing I also want to call out today, um, Nida, is, um, like, how we respond to pinkwashing claims. And um, and this is just kind of a, a, cute, a tip for people who are queer and trans here on this call, uh, especially if they're Palestinians or Palestinians in general. I'll give you an example. Uh, most of the places I go to that is not really like um, like within my comrades, I get a question. Um, you know, why do you you know protect Palestinian rights where your people throw you off the roofs? So throw you off the roofs is a very common term, and I really want to address that specifically. So. My, I know this is very triggering and I work a lot on self-soothing techniques. She has three therapists at this point in the revolution, um, but <laughs> totally. And I have MS and like an old lady. But what I mean is um, you, you could do is like, think about it. Is that person coming actually asking you the question because they are expecting an answer, they're learning, or they're just coming to activate you? Most of the time, if this is the question that they ask, they are coming to activate you. So I actually, my, uh, my, uh, my advice to you is dismiss them. I usually say Google them um, or like, and then I would say like Google is boycotted. So probably you're like a Google person, something like this. Um, like I, I would say something like I'm dismiss them to so dismiss them. However, if somebody who's actually curious or somebody who's like in the like group Zionist, a lot of people are, and then they really, uh, they learned about Palestine and they understood what's going on and they kind of, uh, you know, had to go through a re relearning process um, and decolonize uh, their thoughts, this person is worth speaking to. And then if that person that told you this, tell them three things. First one is throwing people off the roof is something that the Vatican started to kill gay folks and other and other stuff. And then it was adopted by ISIS. ISIS in Iraq, 
a lot of Americans are, are not good in geography. Iraq is a different country than Palestine. It, they're terrorists. It's a very, like not terrorist Iraq, but I mean that organization that, that is terrorist. That's not the right thing. And uh, Palestinians are saved by their people. And Palestinians are part of a, of a family. Like they have mothers they care about. They have sisters they care about. They have other things. So, And the last but not least is um, we never had any uh, anti sodomy laws before the British mandate and colonization. We have been introduced a lot of anti sodomy laws within the, Isra- the state of Israel. So always remember this. Um, and I know we're coming up to a close, so I want to give it back to Nida. Uh, what are your reflections on this today, Habibti? What do you think? What do you oh, want to, okay. what do you think we need to take over? Yeah. Rahi, like, I know we talked about us talking today, but like, even while you're talking, I'm learning so much. I never knew that, that the first anti-sodomy laws were introduced when the f- occupiers came. And, you know, I said, we talked about that earlier. Like, I never knew our people to be hateful. And so it was always so confusing to me when I I, I saw it from the propaganda. So thank you for, for teaching me. Um, you mentioned something uh, right a few minutes ago, and I know we are coming to a close. So, so let's close with that. Um, you mentioned a few minutes ago about boycotting. So, you know, we did talk about queer, uh, trans LGBTQ plus feminism. And what are our takeaways? Like, what do we do? We, you know, you said boycott. So, I, I feel like takeaways today is to, for people to commit to doing at least one thing today and every day for Palestine until Palestine is free. Um, and the simplest way to do this, I think, in my in my opinion, is to, if you're not already doing this, is to start boycotting Israeli and pro-Israeli products and institutions, like Mama Ganoush just said, uh, Google, Microsoft, um, you know, there's a BDS committee national movement that you can follow also to get uh, information on, uh, uh, information that's on point. And that, I believe, Ganoush, I believe that's the minimum people can do. Um, I, I don't know, there's other things that people can help continue fight for Palestinian liberations, um, you know, there's things like what we're doing, right? We're sitting here talking, educating people in our community about what, you know, what we've learned ourselves. And we hope that people who are watching, um, can take that information and teach people and, and then also ask them to let, to let people know that, uh, you know, queer and trans Palestinian LGBTQ Palestinian folks exist and and we're here creating and wanting to live as well um you also mentioned thank you so much uh you mentioned the organizations and you know i feel like people need to start beginning to get organized in a, in a way where you find an organization that most uh stands with your um, ethics and morals and join them, Uh, become a part of a local group that advocates for Palestinian rights. Um, You know, Ganoush, thank you so much. You mentioned AROC, the Arab Resource and Organizing Center, JVP, Jewish Voices for Peace, Mecca is an organization organization in the Bay Area. Anyone can donate and support its Middle Eastern Children's Alliance. There's local resistance groups like the Alameda Friends and Family for Ceasefire, Bay Area Education for Palestine, or Bay Area Artists for Palestine, and many more. Um, Mama Ghanoush, do you have anything, please? uh, I know you have organizations. You can donate ongoing uh money to to help these grassroots movements and mutual aid groups um do you have any other suggestions takeaways for for our our audience today yeah no i would just say if you're somebody that have a voting power make sure you don't vote for people that are supporting genocide or pro-israel um this is voting season for americans um i know voting is terrible some places but continue to vote and show up against candidates um, and make sure that you also educate yourself about the local lobbies and institutions that support candidates and organizations while you're doing your picks. Um, APAC has a lot of different names, so make sure you do your research. Um, and then the last thing is donate to trusted grassroots movements. 
um, donate to trusted ones. There's a lot of them around. Um, and I, um, I want to also, I know we're coming up to an end. Uh, we have uh, an incredible session coming ahead. Um, and I think that the best person to do that in beautiful introduction is Habibit al <laughs> And before, and before I go, before I go, I just want to say that to, um, if there's anyone from Palestine who heard us, we're from you, we're from our people, we're from our people, God bless you, and God bless you, and we're in the street every day from you. Let's be free of Palestine, in the name of Allah. Inshallah, God bless you, Inshallah. We love you, Palestine. Thank you, Ghanoush. You switched this. You script the script on me. Um, but coming up, we're coming to a close. This was an amazing hour. Uh, Mama Ghanoush on Instagram at Mama Ghanoush or MamaGhanoush.com with two U's. Get involved. Uh, if you're not in the Bay, look for your local organizations and get involved. If you're an artist, look for your local Middle Eastern artist organizations or theater groups and get involved. We need you and we need your skill and um, your steadfastness. Um, we need everyone to liberate Palestine. So to introduce the next um, uh, session, uh, it's my honor to introduce it. It's called There is a Field Screening and Discussion Description. In October 2000, a police officer shot and killed unarmed 17 year old Asil Asla. His story is tragically familiar to America for Americans, but Asil was not killed in Ferguson, New York, Atlanta, or Minneapolis. He was tragically killed, a uh, Palestinian teenager who was murdered by Israeli police as he participated in a demonstration calling for an end to Israeli occupation and settler colonialism. There is a field began as a play about Asil told from the perspective of his older sister, Nardine, through Nardine's struggle to cope with the murder of her brother. The play offers uniquely personal lens for learning about intersecting systems of oppression, in, including Zionism and white supremacy, root causes of state-sanctioned violence, and structured racism. Donkey Saddle Projects filmed a performance reading of There is a Field, performed by activists, artists, and organized from the movement for Black Lives. There is a Field film weaves together their performance with archival footage of Hassel and the ar activists' own realizations of the parallels they see between Hassel's story and the experiences of Black, Indigenous, people of color communities in the United States. The film is set in Palestine and performed by BIPOC artists and activists in the U.S., build solidarity across intersectional struggles for liberation and decolonization, and is sure to spark conversation and connection. So I'd like to introduce uh, A.J. Antonis Marquis uh, with speakers uh, Jen Marlowe, uh, who is the founder of Donkey Saddle Projects, James Klin, who is a performer and activist, and Anissa Mahmoud. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, and here you guys go. Thank you so much. And thank you for that amazing conversation about the intersection between queerness and Palestinian identities. Um, it is a, such an important conversation to be having right now. Um, thank you all for all of that.